the T session. In the second academic session, which is on science of Vastu, religious building and temple architecture, we have three eminent speakers in Professor Joy Shen, who is a professor and principal investigator, Sandhi Ayati Kharagpur. He will be speaking on recognizing the heliocentric, geocentric reciprocities and complementaries, recovery of Indian architectural, uh, architectural knowledge system, Vastu Vidya. He will be followed by Professor Eman Tiwari, Professor Emeritus, History of Art, who would speak on sparsh or touch as silent communication in Indian cultural heritage. Then we will have Dr. Rajot Shannal. Dr. Chandsanal is Assistant Professor, Department of Archaeology, University of Calcutta. He would speak on elusive, picturesque landscapes, elements of natural and built environs in the inscriptional corpus of early Bengal. The entire session would be coordinated by Professor K. N. Dikshit. May we kindly request Professor Joyashan, who is already on the dais, Professor Eman Tiwari, Dr. Rajot Channel, and Professor K. N. Dikshit to kindly come up on the dais. Professor Eman Tiwari, Dr. Rajot Channel, could you please come up on the dais? The first, uh, we are already behind schedule by 15 minutes, so you would request the speakers to kindly stick to time if possible. If you can kindly uh, shorten it by five minutes, it would be very convenient for all of us. Because we have nine speakers today and we have got uh, two more sessions excluding this. So uh, without much ado, it's over to Professor K. N. Dikshit, who would be coordinating this discussion. We will have the speakers first, after the end of the three speakers. There will be a discussion, and again we'd kindly request you, I've been instructed to kindly request you to finish off this entire discussions by 12.45. Over to Professor K. N. Dikshit for this particular session on science of Vastu, religious building and temple architecture. <laughs> Dear friends, colleagues, ladies, Secretary Maharaji, Durga Basu, and others. I am very, very happy to say that the speakers, Professor Joy Sain, who is the professor and the principal investigator, Chan He, IIT, Kharagpur. I had a very long association with IIT Kharagpur. say it is more than 40 years, since 1973 onwards. And uh, my first cousin was also there. And uh, he was also handling the uh, chemistry department at that time. Professor V. N. Abbasi. So I had the occasion to visit Kharagpur also. Our second speaker, Professor Tiwari, from BHU, a well-known Jain scholar. When I say Jain scholars, his knowledge about Jainis is not less than whatever the earlier gurus in the Jain field was, whether they were S.B. Deo or the person from the Ahmedabad, whom name I am forgetting, who was in American Institute. <coughs> so they were the well-known stalwarts, including U.P. Shah and others. And the young man who is sitting by my side, 
Rajat Sanyal. He is a young, working very hard to come up and understand actually what should be the field archaeology. Unless until you don't know how to do the excavation, explore, and to connect them, which is trying to pass on being a teacher to the younger generation. So the time is very short. What is the time now? Fifteen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. As the time is uh, very limited, this is up to 12 o'clock? No, uh, 1 o'clock. So, so I, I think everybody can be given 30 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes uh, we will do. So now I am giving you 2 3 minutes more. It is uh, 11.40. You so Mr. Sage, please. Please, please. Uh, so the time. <laughs> but please, eh? stick to time. Uh, Pranam, Namaskar. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, it's like homecoming, coming to a place where IIT Kharagpur again and again has always got a f place at the lotus feet of uh, all the respected Maharajas of the Sri Ramakrishna Mission and Mutt Order. And especially in this holy premises, which was uh, installed by one of the great brothers of Swami Vivekananda, that is Ganges, Gangadhar Maharaj, who actually came and did a Bhumi Puja just in the next road in the house of one of my batchmates at IIT Kharagpur. This was about uh, almost 100 years back. <coughs> so I had been to that. So coming here is almost uh, a great uh, pleasure, delight, and of course my own name, Joy. Thank you. And, uh, and last but not the least, uh, my pronoun to one of my uh, person who patronizes Swami Supanandanda Ji. He is like my teacher because he has always been a teacher at Narendrapur and other places. So it's always a great delight. Uh, when I walked into the hall, Maharaja came and gave me a, an alingon, you know, which is the best thing that can happen to you. The best thing that can happen to you. So I'll move very fast. Uh, this, is a, this is a trouble. This is a problem. And this is also a solution. And this is also a disha, a direction to what is Vastu. And you know, Vastu has really climaxed her mind. So I'll go very fast because there's a paucity of time. And if Maharaja and our respected chair permits, there is a six minute short film which IIT Kharagpur has prepared on Indian knowledge systems. Otherwise, I won't show that. But I've kept it loaded. So uh, three questions. What exactly is Vastu? I mean, what are the visible measured indicators of that? Second. Is Vastu still practiced properly today? I'm trying to come straight to the point. If yes, then what are the validations? Is it in vogue? Is it pertinent today? And then what are the sciences? You know, the measured sciences, the analytical sciences, the calculated sciences, you know, the brilliant session just prior to us, which was archaeology. It's all about tangibles. You know, you cannot make stories and narratives like that. It's all about tangibles. And what is the meta science behind all this? So that takes us to Swamiji himself. This is from the historical evolution of India. And Swamiji says, I mean, time memorials too, right now, today, March 3rd, 2021. There's a, there's a toggle, there's a fight between three groups of people, you know. When philosophers are devoid of realization, you know, they come to rituals. And when kings are devoid of good governance and morality, you know, they come to an autocracy and subjugation. And there's a third group who does not like the first two and they think uh, life is all about pleasure and leisure and fun and frolic. So there's a triangular fight. This is the term Swamiji uses. The Vastu has been both the victim and also uh, the exposure of this triangular fight, you know, from et eternal times right to the present time. So 
You know, this is a picture where you find the three groups fighting with each other. And this is just not about Vastu. This is about the entire Indian knowledge system. You know, Swamiji has to go to Chicago. Uh, Gurudev, Rabindranath Tagore has to get the Nobel Prize. Sri Aurobindo has to get a disciple from France, Mother Mira Alfaza, you know, to get that international stamp and come into the uh, flare. If I put it that way, you know, if we put it that way. So these are serious problems and I have to deliver a seminar in English even today with a half-hearted knowledge in Hindi and not a full knowledge in Bengali, though I am a Bengali. So these are some of the troubles that runs through our knowledge streams. মানে স্বামীজি এই নিয়ে অনেকবার অনেক কথা বলেছেন একটা বাংলায় কথা না বলে প্রাণটা মহারাজ আর ঠিক দিচ্ছিল না তো সো অ্যাকচুয়ালি ওয়ান অফ দ্য মোস্ট মেজর ইন্ডিকেটার্স অফ দ্য বাস্তু ইজ অ্যাকচুয়ালি দ্য মন্ডেলা ইউ নো দ্য মন্ডেলা হ্যাজ বিন হিউজ থিং হোয়াট এক্স্যাক্টলি ইজ দ্য মন্ডেলা নো বডি নোজ মানে দের ইজ আ স্লোকা উইচ ইজ রিসাইডেড বাই থাউজেন্ডস অফ পিপল অখণ্ড মন্ডলা কারম ব্যাপ্তন ইয়ে না চরা চরম so there is an undifferentiated orb circuit of things consciousness whether we know or don't know doesn't matter but it exists in some form or the other but the temples that we see the prasadams that we see the little sacrificial or altar that we make are all supposed to be reflections of that i mean how is it possible there was ancient science which somehow was continuous discontinuous integrated disintegrated you know uh, it was just going on for a long time but and then it ramified into a lot of schools in different parts of india and even beyond even even europe has its own system of ancient mandala for example the gothic churches the more esoteric churches of christianity are also based on the mandala because i was uh, i was brought up uh, in a school in the united states which were protestants of the christian unitarian fellowship order who actually patronized swami ji when Swamiji was there in the West to a very large extent when other branches of Christianity was against him was against him so this is a beautiful thing that we have to see so our temples are uh, are expressions of that and there are different versions of mandala I mean the the whole cosmos for example the spiral galaxy is some kind of a mandala you know the the plan of Auroville for example is based on the mandala which is a spiral mandala you know the Borobudur uh, the temple of thousand Buddhas is based on the mandala so we have a positive time I'm not going to read my slides and the mandala even comes comes in the centripetality and the centrifugality of a flower poddo it's the only flower which blooms uh, from a panka which is punk which is dirty uh, mud on the one hand and and the day it blooms when the sunlight comes out so it's a, it's a flower jeta uh, phute uthe with the marriage of the most lowest and the most highest you know, that's why padma which is a symbol of mandala is the expression of indian spirituality and also uh, a portion from of spirituality which is bahaism you know because when they came to india and built the biggest temple they made a lotus version of it but they don't follow the twos and the fours and the six but they follow the odd circle so it's a nine petal mandala you know that's a persian sepharial kabala system of mandala so mandalas are there all over and uh, and because of this one lady who came to india and gave her everything that is Uh, Professor Alice Boner in, in, in Varanasi, there is a gallery dedicated to her. She came to India uh, with Pandit Uday Shankar and she fell in love with Indian iconography. This is, this is what she says and she says these diagrams, these sacred diagrams of profane diagrams, whatever they are, are resultant of countless centuries of meditations, you know, deep meditations. You know, they have to, so the artist who is actually sculpting out of stone is also meditating within to come without. to do the sculpting so that the world inside is also connected with the world outside the upanishads say rupam rupam prati rupam so every form outside has a pattern behind which is the prati rupam and the prati rupam has a layer of the intangible vast the infinite the brahman the absolute outside so there is a two way journey from the inside to outside and from outside to inside this is a penguin dictionary of the mandala you know marshi elidi joseph campbell you know marija gimbutas a lot of uh, great people that come together and they have uh, talked about the mandala and the mandala is today is, is a universal symbol accepted by scholars all over the world so why i am saying the mandala again, again because uh, the core of vastu is the vastu purusha mandala you know vastu is environment 
Purusha is supposed to be, supposed to be the spirit that indwells. You know, in this room, if people are not here, if respect Maharaja is not here, if our celebrated chairman is not here, then there's no life here. So the vastu of this room is first embellished by the picture of Mahapurush Maharaj. I mean, uh, the, I mean, Shamiji is Mahapurush. I mean, Shamiji is Mahapurush. Mahapurush, which is Shiva Anandaji. So it's just not the physical space, which is Khetra, but it's also the presence of the spirit within, which is Khetra Gya. You know. So it is actually the Khetra Khetra Gya connection which makes, and the relationship is evolutionary, going up, and also it's coming down, involutionary. What is that? You know, like Maharaja came and gave me an alingam today morning. You know, so Maharaja's blessings got involved in me. That's involution. That's asambhuti. And I look up to Maharaja as a blessing. You know, that is sambhuti. So that is evolution. So sambhuti, asambhuti, the foundations of Isha Upanishad are the twin mysteries of the mandala, which we have to understand. And Sri Aurobindo has done great work on that. It was initiated by, by Swamiji in his phenomenal talks, the microcosm and the macrocosm. Swamiji wanted to work more, but he left, perhaps left it for Sri Aurobindo yeah, and to carry on, on that lines. So the second question is that, is Vastu still practiced properly? And I, am, I know I'm actually taking up time every, for every slide. It's like uh, the clock is ticking. If yes, then what are these validations? These are examples right from today, the last 30, 40, 50 years. So I'll go through them very quickly. One famous man, a Goanese Christian, you know, a graduate of MIT, architect Charles Correa, was actually a specialist in Indian mandala, which comes from Hinduism, Jainism. You know, uh, Jainism, because the, the foundation of Jainism, in fact, one of the oldest branches of Sanatana Dharma is actually Jainism. Because uh, if you look at the first Tithankara, Rishav Adinath, he is actually with uh, Dattatreya and Sanat Kumar, the three uh, patron sages of India, is actually taking a spirituality, a, a lesson from Hangsha Bhagavan. The description is there in the Bhagavad Purana. So there, the three lineages, you know, the Nath Parampara, you know, the Sant Parampara, the Jaina Parampara, and, and the Parampara of Sanat Kumar, Chandogya Upanishad, and you know, Bhuma, they're all, you know, together. It's, it's even slightly before the Saptarishis, you know, it's, it's right there. So we need to look at all this. So this is Charles Kuria designing the Jahar Kala Kendra based on the Vastu Purusha Mandala, a graduate from MIT. And he shows the Nabagraha Mandala, and the Nabagraha Mandala is also there, I'll show you. Uh, which is uh, which is the temple architecture of Belur Mat, you know, which Swamiji gave to Vigyananda Ji, and on the Brihaspati Sthan, the Jupiter coordinate, Sri Ramakrishna sits, you know, Thakur Rukhane because uh, Brihaspati is just not the Jupiter, but he is Brahmanashpati, and also Brahman uh, of the, of the Vedas. In the in the later Quranic times, I mean, the position degraded to gods and planetary positions, but in the Vedic time, it was an integral whole. So we need to look there in search of the Vasu. So Charles Kuria brings that, and that is also evident in a Bengali person from Kolkata. There was no Kolkata that time, really. He, he walked from central Bengal and went to Rajasthan on the invitation of Jai Singh to, to design the city of Jaipur on the basis of the Nabagraha Mandala. You know. So I think uh, many of us know and many of us don't know that uh, the plan of Jaipur is actually done by a Bengali architect. Because Bengal and Rajasthan had, uh, even before the Marwais came to Kolkata, Bengal and Rajasthan had connections, the Jaina. Because the Tithankaras had two largest establishments in India. One is the Rajasthan Gujarat Parampara. You know. Nemi Nath, and where Swamiji went, you know, the hills of Dattatreya, and also Mukutmanipur, Ambikanagar, and all the places which is in Bengal. We need to search that. There's a lot there. So this is the mandala, which is in Jaipur. This is evidence two. Evidence three. This is by one of the greatest architects. I met him when I was a student. This is Christopher Benninger, an American architect, uh, who also gave his everything to India, to Indian architecture. Here he sits with an Indian kurta. And he designs the United uh, uh, World College uh, at Pune, which is actually based on the mandala. Because he sits, he thinks that all the colleges of the world, Harvard, MIT, IIT, Kharagpur, Ramakrishna Mission, you know, Belur Mats, you know, uh, Vidyapit, they should all come together as one single system of uh, education. So that is Akhanda Mandala Karan. So this uh, idea was portrayed in the United World College at, at Pune. I've been to this building. If you ever get a chance, you should see this. So, uh, I mean, Christopher is one of the greatest architects of India, and, uh, and uh, he has designed so many things. So the architects are practicing the Vasu Purusha Mandala. 
and much before that after Albert Meyer died in the, a plane crash Pandit Nehru invited this man from France Lee Corbusier to design the city of Chandigarh and you, with him you see that young boy whom we have met is like the doyen of Indian architecture today and when Corbusier was actually moving in Chandigarh he met Mr. Verma and there's a huge story to uh, say here who was a chief engineer Verma introduced Corbusier to the Vastu Purusha Mandala so that's a sketch by Corbusier himself on the Purusha which is the which looks like a, which looks like a trident a two-pronged Bajra a two-pronged Bajra you know so, and Corbusier said that I should have been younger right now to know more about India and the more to know more about the about at the Mandala and this is a book which is published by MIT uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology New Cambridge so it's right there the page number is also and this is a Facebook post of mine because I have to do a lot of Facebook posting because all my friends are very young people and you know, are very young people my, my students and everything because uh, uh, I mean they don't have to be with me I have to be with them you know that's the duty of today's teacher you know we cannot think ourselves of someone sitting up so the, the concept of God above is all over it's actually the concept of God within you know Shamiji's new definition of religion the old religion says you believe in a God above but the new religion says you believe in a God within the self within you so the self within me is the self within uh, Tripathi sir you know so when all the selves are connected we are in that Akhanda Mandala you know if we are not connected no matter how many seminars and workshops are there we don't converge because convergence assimilation coming together is the spirit of the Mandala so I'll be faster so that young boy becomes very old and uh, that is Balakrishna Doshi and he got the Nobel Prize in Architecture last year which is Pritzker Prize and uh, one of my student Pallavi I was just speaking to her day before from Carlton Canada has worked a, a PhD on Doshi himself I was a part of the DSC so I know those I know this story very closely you know and Pallavi worked with Doshi ji for the last 25 years and this is the Vastu Shilpa Foundation where a lot of people have worked where also if you know I think you know some, some of you may know in this room where artist engineer Arunendu Bandhupadhyay you know Arunendu Banerjee uh, who works on Tagore, Geddes also worked as an intern in his young days you know so Vastu Shilpa Foundation is a very very big thing is a very very big thing so this finally exploded into a huge thing and uh, about 45 years back uh, uh, Professor Alice Bona, Shadashiv Sharma and Bettina Bomber uh, who is who is the disciple of Bonner wrote this book the Vastu Shutra Upanishad in, in fact this book should be a textbook in most of the schools you know where they have done a painstaking research to go to the Vedic level the Upanishadic Vedantic level then the Puranic level then the later schools of Mansara Mayavatam then the Kerala school vis-a-vis -vis the Kashmir school and the Bengal school of Vastu to do a very systematic work and on, on the right hand side you can see Dr. Bettina Baumut Baumut so I was with her at Indian Institute of advanced studies about four five years back and below you see a small glimpse where we did the Sandhi project with BHU and IIT VHU and so on so this is all about a certitude on which we got a chance to work so I'll be fast from here and then the works of Adam Hardy of Cardiff you know uh, on Indian temple tradition and now uh, Adam has given his, given his whole life after exploring the Mandala and there are at least hundred YouTubes available on the Google today and then at IIT Kharagpur in a very small way Maharaja kindly knows uh, that we have done and this is IIT Kanpur and this is the Sandhi the science and heritage initiative so I'm not going there and finally we did a lot of publications and we did a, a lot of things on Varanasi you know the, the Omkar, Omkar Shetra you know and, and then the Kedar Shetra uh, linked by the Vishya so these are the three hierarchies of the uh, the transcendental consciousness the universal consciousness of the individual individual conscious the Kashi's architecture is actually based on these three circles the two lower circles is the Omkar uh, the two the, the eight and the upper circle is the orb the Chandra Vindyum so this is uh, the divine Vastu Purusha Mandala at Kashi and Diana L. Ek has actually done a lot of work on that I think you know that celebrated book written on by her Kashi the city of light uh, we have we have met her when we had made a small trip to her university and this was about five years back and some of the master examples uh, so I'm running out of time are Auroville and of course Tagore and Gandhiji and where so one of the beautiful thing about Vastu Purusha Mandala is that we don't design the environment we actually design ourselves you know so this one changes rather than changing the environment you know so the environment changes us and when we 
What do we mean by we change? That means we are going from a tamasic rajasic to a swatik rajasic level. You know, that's the first necessary step of evolution. You know, we are respectful to Tripathi sir, we are respectable to the other sirs here. But we should listen more than trying to say our own things. You know, that is a problem with academics, research, and profession today. We are always there to speak and waiting for to get a podium. You know, and not to listen to others and not to listen to others. So the foundation is actually to listen to others, assimilate others, and then come back again and again and do your own work. If you don't do that, we don't understand what is the mandala, who is the purusha, and what is the vastu about it. So now we are going faster. So what is the science and meta-science behind this ancient branch of Indian knowledge system, you know, which was a term first coined by Professor Sharvavali Radhakrishnan, uh, Professor Kapil Krapur, and others at IS uh, Shimla. and. Uh, and uh, a picture of a lady who actually got me to Ramakrishna mission. That is Dr. Kapila Vatsen. This is about 16, 17 years back. Kapilaji went to IIT Kharagpur, saw a little exhibition of the, and then he came and told Prabhananda ji, there's some funny young boys doing something funny at IIT Kharagpur, why don't you call them? So we are invited to an international conference. This is about 16, 17 or 18 years back. I don't, this is about 2003. And we got a chance to come to Gold Park. And, and it was a huge international conference. And then uh, get exposed to the, the gravity of the Ramakrishna mission and order. And I, I, I had a full half an hour, half a day with Kapilaji in this. You know, Kapilaji, Kapilaji said, Joy Bosho, Pol Khao, Jol Khao, Thanda Hoi Bosho, Kotha Pore Habe. You know, so that was that kind of a thing from Kapilaji. I mean, a blessing, absolutely a blessing. So what is this acceptance? Is the acceptance is the mandala itself. And this is one of the greatest uh, signatures where in the year you know, 2004, uh, the Natarajan, you know, which is the mandala of Shiva holding the fire, Agni, the igneous destruction, and Amrita, Soma on the other hand, which is construction. And the, the two opposite currents are coming together in an undifferentiated whole, becomes the basis of quantum physics. You know and it is accepted by CERN, the Center of Particle Physics at Switzerland, and uh, Professor Anil Kakotka takes Nataraj to the courtyard of CERN, and it is established there. And they sang about three important interactions, Swamiji and Nikola Tesla, 1893, Tagore and Heisenberg in Kolkata, 1929, and Tagore and Einstein, 1930, in Berlin, in his own house. Uh, beautiful, you know, and they say this is a long history, and there's a lot of uh, things inside Indian science, meta science, that needs to be accepted. In other words, the mandala got accepted by people of science, people of mathematics, people of algorithm, you know, people of detailed data-driven analytics who won't believe a single thing until and unless there are six or seven iterations and proofs. So this is CERN. This is CERN, and this is this is the beauty of it. And this really opened up a new science, which is the unfolding of the hierarchy. You know, I come to Varanasi, I don't like it. It's a Kachra city, there's garbage everywhere. But the last day I feel like coming back again. You know, I come, feel like coming back again. There's something about the city. So when I come back, I bring back some of my friends. And the third time when I come, I tell my friends, go around, and I just sit next to the Ganga, you know, probably a little contemplative. So I move from the physical to the mental to the cognitive. And then one day, if I'm lucky, something happens to me, and then I'm immersed, immersive reality. I'm immersed in Varanasi. Varanasi is me, I'm in Varanasi. As Christ said, uh, I mean, I am in the Father, the Father is in the me. The Upanishad says, Sarva Bhuta Statman and Sarva Bhuta Anichatman. You know, there are two ways, you know. So I go into the Brahman, the Brahman comes inside me. The two way journey. Sri Ramakrishna Bhashai Onulom Bilom, you know. Sri Ram Krishna Kothamidha. He's the master of masters. You know? I mean, everybody has to go back to Sri Ramakrishna to search for the Vastu Purusha Mandala. So, this is the beauty of it. And this was actually pointed by Norbert Weiner, an absent minded professor at MIT, uh, 1936, who did the cybernetic unfolding. So, what I just said is there in the the four way journey of the human mind. Unless, unless and until we have, a, we have this journey. Bhitore bhitore, inside, inside. We don't understand what exactly is the Vastu Purusha Mandala. It's not to be discussed as a diagram on an AutoCAD platform or done on an illustrator or, on, or on, a, on a SketchUp software. But it has to be felt, lived, 
practiced, absorbed, and you become the mandala. Like Swamiji was mandala. Jekhanei jatshin, there are millions of people moving with him. Akhanda mandala akaram, vaptam swami vivekanandam. You know, so that is, that is the beauty of it. So he becomes a centroid of the movement. So we have to understand, I mean, our buildings and temples are not mandalas. You know, the, the khetragya, inside the khetra is the mandala. The purusha in the vastu is the mandala. You know, so that is something that we have to understand. So these are the walks that we are doing at IIT Kharagpur where archaeology, semantics, iconography, computer science and different streams are coming together to do a collaborative work. When alada alada kachkul we have to come together, you know, because it's a convergence of a lot of knowledge stream together. So, so this is the foundation. There's a lot of time I'm taking. And uh, so this is Uddha Mulam Adhashwakam. Uh, which is very hard to understand. I mean, though we have a Darwinian approach to Indian history and archaeology, but actually Indian history is non-Darwinian. Eh? It comes from the Golden Age, Satya Treta, Dapar Kali, you know, the gold to the Iron Age. So uh, as uh, Pro Professor Nani was rightly saying, and also Professor Tripathi, we need to have, uh, um, it's not that discarding the West, but we need to have a larger paradigm, so, as Sir was saying. And uh, I can tell you from my young students, they are doing that larger part, my history of architecture students. I mean, they, have, they are doing a publication this year, which is mind blowing, which I couldn't have been able to do when I was uh, a young student. You know? So this is the change that is coming to India, uh, the India in the, in the changes. So this is the Savita Mandala of Savitri, uh, as portrayed by Sri Aurobindo. And this is the Vastu Purusha Mandala. So if you take the Vastu Purusha Mandala, just one simple thing, you know. So you have the Uttara and the Purva. Everybody knows that. So what is the Uttara? North. What is the Purva? Which is the East. But the Uttara is also something that will ha happen later. And Purva is something which is something that happened previously. So you see in Sanskrit, many of the words are both space and time. They denote. So this is the beauty of Sanskrit. So when we are dealing with Sanskrit scriptures, we have to work in space, in time, and also with causation, space, time, and causation. That is Indian meta-science. So this is Adam Hardy has books on this. And this, and, and this, was, this is there in the Sam Veda, the Purva Archik, the Uttar Archik. This is there in Kalidash, the Purva Meg, the Uttar Meg. And this is also there in Ravindranath, you know, in all his work, you know. I mean, Jachil Onek Dine Ramari Gan, Tarayami, you know. So that Purva Gaan is again my Uttar Gaan, you know. So this is uh, Rabindranath again and again. So this is beautiful. But where are these in archaeology? So when you look at the Indus Valley seals, you some of these geometrical things. This is about 5,500 years old or 6,000 years old. You, know, you, you see the cross, you see the Vedic swastika telling whether Indus Valley civilization was a post-Vedic civilization or a pre-Vedic. You know, these are big questions, you know, serious questions. And if you look at one of the unical, unicorn seal, so we have worked on this on our software, which is this. You see the Nabagraha Mandala. You see the 3x3, three three, the Rubik's Cube. It's right there. It's right there. It's right there. And you have a centroid. So the Indus Valley people was absolutely aware of the Navagraha Mandala. So Navagraha Mandala is about 6,000 years old. And if Navagraha Mandala is a Vedic symbol, then the Indus Valley civilization is a Vedic civilization. So the questions of aliens coming from outside just collapse. You know, that beautiful book by Michel Danino, you know, the invasion that never was, for which he got his Padma Shri. So, uh, so these are questions, and we have a lot of... Uh, a work on this, just not IIT Kharagpur, a lot of other IITs. So there's a bipolarity you know, between materialism and spiritualism, between the micro world and the macro world, between the huge, you know, between the meditative world and the active world, you know, between Buddha and Shiva. The, the great book by Sister Nevidita, Shiva and Buddha. You know, these are the two sides of the mandala. Because if you're in the center of the mandala, the speed is zero. But if you're in any orb of the mandala, the speed is not zero, it's, it's very high. So all speeds, all rotations are around the centroid which is still, which is the Shiva Lingam. And the outside is the Gauri Pattam, the Gauri Pattam. So the Gauri and the Shiva is the Purusha and the Prakriti of the Akhanda Mandala. You know, forget Shiva and Prakriti, just look at it from the point of view of science. So this is the connection between the potential energy and the kinetic orbs. These are the words of uh, uh, Heisenberg you know, himself. He has, a book, he has a book on this, book on this. So what is the science behind this? These are my last three slides. These are my So the science behind this is actually the sun and the earth, the relationship between the geocentric and the heliocentric. This is Swamiji's lecture at Star Theatre. 
Swamiji has actually mentioned these lines. If you look at Shorbaya uh, Vedanta at Star Theatre by Swami Vivekananda. So the art, I mean, we need a whole workshop on this. I cannot explain in two minutes right now because I'm already out of time. So the Kramta Darshana, you know, the Kramta Darshi, you know, the four, the two solstices and the four equinox, you know, the earth becoming a blue planet, that optimal distance, you know, the, the difference between the geometric meridian and the magnetic meridian, you know, and then the orbing of the earth around it creates on the one hand, all our sciences, environmental sciences, climatic sciences, Tikna all our sciences, material sciences, because of millions of years of evolution, art has developed all these rich materials, the climate and the weather. But the relationship between the art and the sun has also created the Chatur Shankranti, and that is the foundation of our culture, our religion, you know. So the relationship between the sun and the art, on the one hand has created science, and on the other hand it has created culture and religion. Culture and religion. That is the beauty of it. And there lies the answer of the Vastu Purusha Mandala. You have to search both. Kranto Doshi, Shamiji Kovita, Kranto Doshi Shai Rishi, the first line, Kranto Doshi Shai Rishi. Beautiful, you know, about 10 lines poem by Swami Vivekananda. We need to read that. And then, then that becomes the whole foundation of Sri Aurobindo's, you know, uh, treatise of Dibbo Jibon, Life Divine, Life Divine. You know, if you go through the Life Divine, he's actually talking about one thing only the connection between the individual, the universal, to the transcendental and then the role of the transcendental within the individual as the universal. So these are the two way journeys, you know. Atmattok, Vishattok, Vishatit. So these are the three, that's my last slide. And this is actually based on the, the orb of science which is uh, by an Egyptian scientist, I mean Sadi Karnot, the Karnot cycle. At a fridge day you keep a thing, the fridge gets hot. Then the tuck, the compressor starts and then the fridge gets cold. And then you can keep more stuff, yes. And then finally at the end of the day, um, after some time the fridge again say tuck, the compressor starts again. Then the compressor stops and starts again. So what is happening inside a refrigerator is also happening in the macrocosm between earth and sun. So this is the thermodynamic cycle, the Agni Shom Kriya of, of, the, of the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda and the Jajur Veda and all the Upanishads of it, you know, the, the Prashna Upanishad, the Agni and the... And, and this is the Karnot cycle, the science of the Vastu Purusha Mandala, which you need to understand and that is the foundation of the scaling, which is magnetism and its reflection and flow, which is electricity and its connection across space, which is gravity, gravitation. So gravitation, electromagnetism, the, the theories of Maxwell are the foundations of uh, the Vastu Purusha Mandala. So we are trying to work on all this. It's still an open-ended thing. Some papers have been published. It's creating some trouble to begin with, but one day we'll be able to establish sir, some of the truths. So this is uh, the last slide. So ultimately, uh, in the Brahmanda, the macrocosm, there is a there's a connection in the vast, you know, the Saptarishi mandalas and the huge. But right here in this room, it is a microcosm. I know we are all moving, which is the Shetrakya. So I can be a small person in this room. I can be a huge person like Swami Vivekananda, you know, with a universal transcendental personality. So there's a third science which keeps the connect between the two. That is Vasu Vidya, you know, uh, which is Vastu Vidya, the seventh mandala of the Rig Veda, uh, which is Sloka 54 and 55, where Sage Vashishta, Vasu, it comes from the root word Vasu, Isha Vashva, Vasu, dwell, or Vasu Deva, Kutumbakam, you know, so it com all comes from the word Vasu. So when we say Vasati, it means settlements, as Madam was saying, but when you say Basti, it looks slums. So it's all up to you the way you spell it. So it is the art sciences which create. So we come back to great yogi Jagabalka who says, Sangyoga Yoga Iti Yukta. Khetra Paramagna. So the, the highest of the yogas is the yoga, the communication between the yoga of the macrocosm and the yoga of the microcosm and the give and take between it. So that is the foundation of the heliocentric and the, and the geocentric complementarities. So this is a science that comes. So that is Jagabalka of Shukla Jajur Veda and it's right there in Brihadar and Upanishads. I mean, if there is a book, I can open it up and show it to you. And uh, so we are working on all these kind of things and it's also the foundation of the Jaina philosophy, which, which, is, uh, which, is, which comes from an ancient, ancient time. So, so finally, 
the vastu of all vastus the taj mahal of temples is a human body so so the khetraga is inside the human body the human body is inside this room this room is within the institute of culture the institute of culture is within the city of calcutta the city of calcutta is in this planet the planet is in your planetary consciousness so we are within 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 within, within. so how we unfold so that is the khetra khetraga vibhag and also samyoga yoga you know so that is that is the foundation so swami just says the vedic altar is the origin of geometry and it is a taj mahal of all temples so when swami ji went to kakri ghat when he was a paribrajak uh, he had guru brother ganges next to him and he had this great realization but after give me a notebook i want to write this he said uh, the macrocosm and the microcosm are built on the same plan are built on the same plan so that is actually the foundation of the heliocentric complementarities uh, between the two sciences so with this i like to end i hope i could uh, explain some science behind vastu and uh, thank you and if time permits there is a short clip otherwise i this is the work on the indian knowledge system it's about 5 or 6 minutes otherwise i won't show it you know yeah that's up to the chairman sir thank you i think you, you okay not please. now please okay. not yeah. now yeah. 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 thank you i think that should be the decorum yeah. you know, otherwise uh, yeah. i i start behaving like a vastu pandit you know taking over the stage yeah please. thank you thank you thank you very much uh, uh, we will take up questions and answers only after all these speakers they have delivered their lectures now now i will request professor maruti nandan tiwari to give his lecture professor tiwari pranam karta hu thank you very much aapse anumati leke pranam karte ja raha hu good day Thank you, thank you. Are you having good time? Yes. जी मैं मैं शुरू करता हूं क्योंकि अभी वी हैव लिसन जस्ट नाउ अबाउट द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ मंडल इन वास्तु शास्त्र एज वास्तु पुरुष टू एज अ वंडरफुल exposition now i switch over to another aspect which is very human aspect moving around us close to us we are living with that and that is sparsh touch what we call the title is sparsh or touch as silent expression of communication in indian cultural heritage thanks to ramkrishna mission institute of culture and reverend swami ji also to dr professor durga basu ji for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be here to interact and my senior guru like scholars like dikshit ji and friends yesterday we have listened in, in inaugural function about both intangible which we do find in the concept of ekam sat vipra bauda vadanti but that is the foundation or even the dharma it was expressed as well as tangible 
heritage but now what I am going to speak of because one thing is very important whenever we take up anything about the past nowadays it has become very important because of the inquisitiveness of the younger generation of course but what is the relevance today why should we know past so we will have to satisfy them and we will have to give the answer so what I am going to speak on Sparsh will have at least some answer to their inquisitiveness because it, it was in past I will see in visuals it is our present and it will remain in future The universal and perennial language of human communication is Sparsh, touch. Due to present COVID-19 pandemic, we all are observing social distancing, leading to physical and emotional distancing, which, however, can never be a spirit of Bharatiya Sanskriti forever. We will have to come back. Without a sparsh, we can't live. We can't express ourselves. So that is essential. Sparsh is not merely a physical aspect of communication. Rather, it is heartfelt expression of our humanness. Sparsh could also be of different types besides the physical one it could be manasa mental imaginary just one example what we see in dreams vacha verbal or even drishtaya through the eyes so its vitality is, is, is just unimaginable we have to comprehend it it has the power of transmitting different feelings and emotions be it vatsalya Prem, Bhakti, Abhar, Krodh, Assurance, Bharosa or all other kind of feeling so forcefully and instantly in non-verbal mode of silence non-verbal mode of silence nowadays we are trained also to define good and bad touch sparsh for the safety and security of children, girls and women. We all know, sab jante hum log. Now, it's past. In the Vedas, epics, Puranas, Smritis, Sutras and Buddhist and Jain texts, we have enormous references to Sparsh. In Brihadaranyak Upanishad 3.9.4, the Gyanendriya of Tvak, that is the skin, is this Parsh. In Ajitagam 77.4, one way of Diksha, that is initiation, is mentioned through Sparsh. If the Guru utters the Shiva Mantra and his right hand touches the head of the disciple, it will be called Diksha through Sparsh. Diksha is said to be of several types, Netra Diksha, this is the beauty of Indian, Indian wisdom and culture. Netra Diksha, Sparsh Diksha, Vani Diksha and Manas Diksha. One very unique example is, out of so many, one very unique example is of Kabir Das, who merely through Sparsh got Diksha and Guru Mantra from Ramanandji. In Varanasi, we were talking about Varanasi and Varanasi is a city uh, we may go on talking and telling the things. It's wonderful. No, no one can comprehend it. Out of hundreds of suggestions through Sparsh, some are between Bhakta and Bhagavan, Shishya and Guru or Dharmacharya through Charana Sparsh, of the preceptors or the seers, 
प्रेमी प्रेमिका फ्रेंड्स पति पत्नी ब्रदर एंड सिस्टर सन डॉटर एंड मदर फादर ग्रैंड पेरेंट्स एंड ग्रैंड चिल्ड्रन इन दिस कॉन्टेक्स्ट वन यूनिक एग्जाम्पल इज वट वी फाइंड इन पास्ट एज वेल एज विच इज वेरी मच कुड बी सीन इन द प्रेजेंट इज ऑफ भरत मिलाप when ram and lakshman met their brothers bharat and shatrughna after lapse of 14 years exile they got entwined in alingan he was talking about alingan and uh, more than 3 4 times he repeated alingan is 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 a sparsh silent but so vocal so that is the beauty of this sparsh non verbal expression expressing their deep mutual affection and respect this movement is called bharat milap it is narrated in the valmiki's ramayana and tulsidas's ramcharitmanas maine keval do quote kiya tamam mein milta hai it is in continuity in varanasi i am coming from varanasi so therefore i am just quoting one but it is everywhere to be seen in india uh, mostly in north india and also in south india इन वाराणसी दी फेमस भरत मिलाप लीला इट इज कॉल्ड लीला प्ले इज अ वंडरफुल फेमस लखा मेला लखा मेला मीन्स वेयर मोर देन ए लैक ऑफ पीपुल असेंबुल एन असेंबुल टू सी जस्ट द साइलेंट मूवमेंट ऑफ द मीटिंग ऑफ राम एंड लक्ष्मण विद भरत एंड शत्रु इन विच Without spoken words, संवाद कोई डायलॉग संवाद नहीं होगा राम एंड लक्ष्मण एम्ब्रास भरत एंड शत्रुघ्न एंड द इम्पैक्ट इज डिवाइन एंड ब्लिसफुल काशी नरेश भी वहां उपस्थित होते हैं एक लाख लोग केवल वो मूवमेंट देखने के लिए और कुछ नहीं होता वहां ये है दिस इज द हाइट ऑफ द स्पर्श दैट स्पर्श कन्वेज द डीपेस्ट फीलिंग एंड इट इज द प्रेजेंट and it was in past likewise krishna hugs arjun and sudama with love affection and through sparsh generates confidence the texts like rasik priya and geet govind describes the loving embrace of krishna and radha krishna and gopikas giving experience of divine and blissful movements up to the readers when these find manifestation in art forms the experience is the same for the viewers who may be aapko dikhaunga one very important thing may be subject to verification i have read that by mere sparsh of swami ramakrishna paramahans ji vivekanand ji plunged into bhav samadhi it was like sparsh diksha to Swami Vivekananda ji further at last moment of life swami ramakrishna paramahansa ji transmitted all his spiritual powers to swami vivekananda ji merely by sparsh kitni kitna vital hai isko and it is both when it comes into into visual expression it becomes tangible otherwise it is non tangible दोनों है व्यक्ता व्यक्ता व्यक्त भी है ये मूर्ता मूर्त बिसाइड्स द मेरेकिल ऑफ साइलेंट कम्युनिकेशन थ्रू स्पर्श बिसाइड्स द मेरेकिल ऑफ साइलेंट कम्युनिकेशन थ्रू स्पर्श इज डिपिक्टेड इन नॉन वर्बल एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ आर्ट फ्रॉम डिफरेंट प्लेसेस जस्ट फ्यू वंस देवगढ़ कन्नौज खजुराहो महाबलीपुरम एलोरा भुवनेश्वर गंगई कोंड जोलपुरम मीन्स पैन इंडियन बेसिस the kumar sambhav of kalidas 5th century refers to the pani grahan of shiv parvati vivah the vivah ritual where in the open palm of parvati is placed over the open right hand palm of shiv through which the first sparsh of newly wed couple is enabled and this tradition continues to date आज भी शादियों में यही होता है पानी ग्रहण दिस इज दूटी कंटिन्यूटी ऑफ इंडियन ट्रेडिशन नाउ नाउ एनी यंग पर्सन विल अंडरस्टैंड यस 
we we are experiencing this we are living with this so this is not merely our heritage of past it is the present in the vivaha murti of shiva and parvati this is clearly visible in the images also likewise we find few images of chandesha anugraha ram sita which i will show in the visuals sparsh in indian tradition reveals multiple levels of communication of human feelings which could be noticed also in case of man to animal or even animal to animal mainly in the context of their babies beat cow beat elephant beat lion we know cow horse and pets all have the feel of sparsh kevali human feeling nahi hai emotions nahi hai feel of sparsh and they could be pacified and loved merely through sparsh bar se aate hain hamara jo pet hai hamare paas aata hai aur nahi kariye to naraz hota hai agar aap haath pher dijiye kuch nahi kaha aapne kya hai ye ye miracle nahi hai to aur kya hai this is miracle of indian culture <coughs> to some extent ab ek naya udaharan de rahe hain aapko to some extent it could be seen in man and tree and vegetation as well one interesting example is of woman and tree motif known as shal vanjika so popular in texts and art at sachi bharavut mathura and elsewhere in case of legend of siddharthas mother mother when uh, who subsequently became buddha birth in the shal kunj group of lumbini when maya mother of siddharth held a branch of shal tree the pain of delivery was felt by her ye sab textual mein bol raha hu actually relationship between woman and tree it could be any tree but mainly we find shal and ashok was believed to be reciprocal just as a tree could fertilize woman the woman could also impart fertility to the tree as in the concept of dohad or longing of tree and plants for the contact with beautiful women that helps them to blossom even out of season one such example is in the malavika agni mitra of kalidas in which young malavika is shown performing dohad on ashok tree in palace garden shal bhanjika motif is also applied for the maiden kumaris standing under shal or other trees in the action of bending its branch ye hai sparsh ka miracle another very interesting dimension of sparsh is touch therapy which is endorsed in the atharva ved kal baat hui na ki sab root wahi se aata hai ved se aata hai whatever we find the seed or the core comes from sprouts from the vedas to atharved mein hai which is endorsed in the atharved as abhimarshan way of treatment abhimarshan means sparsh through it is through sparsh and which is in vogue even today आज भी स्पर्श चिकित्सा की बात हम यहाँ भी सुनते हैं और बाहर के संदर्भ में भी कभी कभी ऐसा ध्यान में आता है कि मैंने सुना है पढ़ा है कि स्पर्श के माध्यम से चिकित्सा होती है और आज भी हमारे यहाँ तो महापुरुषों का आपने आचार्यों का स्पर्श पाकर ही आपके आशीर्वाद दीजिए और उससे आप आपको लगता है कि नहीं यू आर नाउ वेल और कठिनाई क्या है कि आज की चिकित्सा में पहले हम लोग बचपन में ये करते थे कि डॉक्टर के पास गए तो डॉक्टर साहब हमें देख लीजिए तो यहां भी देखते थे यहां भी देखते थे यहां भी देखते थे वो स्पर्श से ही आधा मर्ज दूर होता था आज डॉक्टर स्पर्श नहीं करता तो कोविड की बात है लेकिन कोविड के पहले भी अब कम कम हो गया क्योंकि एवरीथिंग इज बेस्ड ऑन दी सारे के सारे टेस्ट आ गए डॉक्टर ने कहा कोई देखने की जरूरत नहीं मैं सब देख रहा हूं इसमें हो गया मगर डेट वर्क तो मेडिकल साइंस के लिए भी ये जरूरी है और तो अथर्वेद कहता है विच इज इन वोक टूडे इन अथर्वेद थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ चिकित्सा ट्रीटमेंट आर मेंशन दैहिक 
दैट इज फिजिकल नेचुरोपैथी और मेडिसिनल दैविक डिवाइन एंड भौतिक दैट इज मेटीरियल मेटीरियल और सर्जरी इंस्ट्रूमेंटल इन डिवाइन मेथड थ्रू अभिमर्षण स्पर्श थ्रू मंत्रोच्चार डिजीजेज आर टेकन आउट और क्योर्ड आप आप इट गिव्स द आइडेंटिटी आपका पुत्र है आपका पौत्र है आप जाते हैं आंख बंद करके आप कहते हैं कौन कुछ नहीं बोलते हैं तो कह देता है पापा है बाबा है स्पर्श पूरी आइडेंटिटी दे देता है नेत्रहीन व्यक्ति को आप स्पर्श करते हैं वो आपको तुरंत बता देता है कि आप हैं कौन तो स्पर्श का इतना विस्तृत स्वरूप था नाउ आई वु ट्राई टू शो यू ए फ्यू विजुअल्स थ्रू विच आई आई विल मेक यू एप्रिशिएट ये ऑडिबल नहीं होंगे हम यहां से चेक कर ऐसे यहां से भी ऑडिबल हैं अच्छा नहीं पहला 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 इट लुक्स दैट दिस इज मियरली ए स्कल्पचर एंशियंट स्कल्पचर कमिंग फ्रॉम सम बता रहे इट इज फ्रॉम महाबलीपुरम रॉक कट ऑफ कोर्स बट नाउ द ब्यूटी ऑफ स्पर्श यू सी दो द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट ब्यूटिफुल डेलीकेट स्पर्श इज बिटवीन मदर एंड चाइल्ड बेबी एंड हियर यू फाइंड बोथ द एग्जाम्पल ह्यूमन मां की गोद में बालक एज वेल एज काउ ये स्वयं कृष्ण है हु इज मिल्किंग द काउ एंड यू सी द काउ हमें मालूम है कि क्या होता है बच्चे के सामने आने के बाद मिल्क भी उतर जाता है मिल्क दूध भी लेता है सो द इंटायर थिंग वी नो एंड वट इज वट इज द रिजल्ट ऑफ द स्पर्श एंड विच वॉज नॉट ओनली इन ह्यूमन बींग्स बट इन एनिमल बींग्स महाबलीपुरम सेवन सेंचुरी नेक्स्ट इन अदर डायमेंशन ऑफ स्पर्श but most of you must be knowing this is this comes from the shavatar rather vishnu temple of devgarh 6th century but the beauty i would like to show is vishnu reclining the pose is just wonderful very relaxed mood and here you find lakshmi lakshmi unka charan chap kar rahi hain aur us process mein उनकी उंगली चटकाना जिसको कहते हैं उस प्रोसेस को यहां डिपिक्ट किया गया है ये है स्पर्श तो आर्ट में भी बहुत डेलिकेटली चीजों को दिखाया गया है और इसी को बहुत क्लोजली आप यहां देख सकते हैं ये उसी दिस मच नेक्स्ट ये भी दशा दिस अगेन कम्स फ्रॉम द सेम टेम्पल दशावतार रेदर विष्णु टेम्पल ऑफ सिक्स सेंचुरी गजेंद्र मोक्ष द स्टोरी यू ऑल नो नाउ द विष्णु हिमसेफ इज कमिंग डाउन टू इमेंसिपेट और हेल्प द एलिफेंट बट हियर द ब्यूटी इज दैट विष्णु इज इन त्वरा इन इन सो हरी द वे द इंटायर डिपिक्शन इज डन इज is suggestive of that he is moving to the earth hurriedly and in that process he has almost reached and hurled the wheel chakra which is here gra and here you see the elephant and the beauty is elephant trunk is touching the feet of vishnu nahi bol sakta bagar apna apna bhav wo still in silence the elephant is expressing his humility as well as his gratitude to vishnu to bahut delicately art mein bhi the artist has not only depicted the forms but the spirit also he he could get into and that is the beauty of the indian art through which we can understand indian art next 
विवाह मूर्ति इट कम्स फ्रॉम कन्नौज फरुखाबाद डिस्ट्रिक्ट नियर कानपुर इन उत्तर प्रदेश एट सेंचुरी प्रतिहार शिव पार्वती वेडिंग विवाह मूर्ति विच इज कॉल्ड कल्याण सुंदर बट कल्याण सुंदर इज नॉट करेक्ट टर्म नो वेर वी फाइंड इन एनी एनी टेक्स्ट इट इज विवाह मूर्ति और पार्वती परिणय एस कुमार संभव सेज यू सी द फर्स्ट स्पर्श एंड थ्रू द स्पर्श दे आर वेड लॉक्ड एन अदर इमेज इन भारत कला भवन नेक्स्ट 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 Ravana Guru Nugra. The all the images you have seen, but only the the dimension I am just showing. This Ravan lifting the mountain, trying to, and here you find out of fear because mountain uh, tilted a, a little bit, and here you find Parvati just stretching her self to come closer to Shiv out of fear, which is called Tras, or Tamil. Uh, प्रिय पुराण में इसकी पूरी की पूरी कथा भी मिलती है पुराणों में इंस्क्रिप्शंस में मिलता है कि यह दिस वाज दिस वाज ए सॉर्ट ऑफ लीला ऑफ शिव कि पार्वती को करीब लाने के लिए वो यह पूरा का पूरा कार्य संपन्न हुआ एक तो यह है दूसरा अहंकार के कारण रावण ने यह किया तो उस भाव को स्पर्श के माध्यम से और यानी इसे कहते हैं त्रास कालिदास ने कहा है त्रास आउट ऑफ फियर One comes closer, and that that brings the sparsh, and sparsh brings the feelings. Next, Uma Meheshwar so common, and not only it is it is it is Uma Meheshwar of Shiva and Parvati, Vishnu and Lakshmi, and all other deities you find in in Alingan Mudra, so profusely depicted. Here again, the sparsh brings or gets the. experience and expression of uh, uh, divine love and also indian culture that how how they they were uh, they could understand properly the love and the expression of the love and in that they they didn't hesitate in depicting our deities even in intense embrace ये भारतीय संस्कृति की ओप, का ओपननेस भी एक और था बिकॉज दीज वेर कार्ड ऑन द टेम्पल्स टेम्पल ऑन इट इज इन वाराणसी बट एवरी वेयर थाउजेंड ऑफ स्कल्पर आर फाउंड नेक्स्ट दिस इज दिस कम्स फ्रॉम गंगई कोंड चोलपुरम चंडेशानुग्रह पुराणों में कथा मिलती है चंडेश वॉज ए डिवाउट डिवोटी ऑफ शिव एंड शिव was was very very happy with him and he is honoring chandesh and it, in course of honoring what is he doing he is just putting the turban over the head of chandesh here again the sparsh and that sparsh of aap aradhya dev mahadev shiva to the devotee brings in through sparsh the intense intense uh, love of the deity for for the devotee and devotee is is almost lost vinay murti next khajuraho parshuna temple here you find ram sita okay but what is important is one hand one right hand lower right hand of ram is you can see over the head of hanuman hanuman in a small figure kyunki hanuman was vinay murti bhakti murti and in in vinay and bhakti one gets gets smaller and smaller and, and comes to the smallest point bhakti mein aap apne ko chhota karte hain wahi aap bade hote hain aap and here you find ram and hanuman just touching each other and sparsh brings again the same feeling which we have seen in case of chandesha nugra next quick quick alingan murti of kamadev and rati next jain context yakshi ambika she is the cultic uh, version of matri devi matri puja 
इन अंबिका इन जैन कॉन्टेक्स्ट अंबिका पार्वती इन ब्राह्मणिकल कॉन्टेक्स्ट एंड हारिथ इन सो एवरी एवरी कल्ट एडॉप्टेड एंड हियर इट इज द जैन कॉन्टेक्स्ट बिकॉज तीर्थंकर इज हियर बेबी दो स्पर्श नेक्स्ट पुत्र वल्लभा अप्सरा फिगर यू फाइंड अ ब्यूटिफुल डैमसेल जस्ट होल्डिंग एंड रेदर प्लेइंग विद द बेबी द मातृभाव इज सो प्रोफ्यूजली सजेस्टेड एंड हियर अगेन थ्रू टच द इंटायर फीलिंग मदरली फीलिंग इज बीइंग मैनिफेस्टेड नेक्स्ट पंडित जी पंडित जी बस खत्म बस प्लीज दिस इज द हां ये अगेन अनदर फिगर ऑफ द जैन कपल पेरेंट ऑफ द तीर्थंकर holding the baby next this you have seen already this again from mahabalipuram two monkeys what they are doing you can you can you, yourself make out next this is the living bharat milap <coughs> of natyam lip varanasi <coughs> just wonderful only this movement is being watched by lakhs of people next so with this i end and i am really thankful that you have given me a patient hearing i have spoken on an altogether different subject but i i think that it is vital vital for human being animal being or for ourselves proving that we are human being ha next okay. nikal gaya Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor um, Tiwari, for giving your beautiful talk on sparse or touch as silent. It is something a tradition in our country with different relationships, no doubt. And uh, this was an important aspect. which was not touched earlier at least i have not attended any such seminar so thank you once again now i will request rajat sanyal to kindly deliver his lecture regarding his uh, scholar he is a young uprising scholar from calcutta university working in the field and uh, i trust that what way he will speak that will go with the delegates with a meaningful thought so professor sanya thank you sir sir honorable honorable chairperson sir esteemed dignitaries my teachers senior colleagues friends and uh, above all the maharajas of ramprasad mission uh, my talk without getting into uh, an introductory uh, i mean an introduction to the details of the theme i'll directly uh, come to the um, title of the thing of the of my presentation as you can see this is uh, a question with which i intend to start actually i uh, want to end up with also this question and this title is uh, heavily influenced by a recent work if you kindly take a look at my abstract if it's circulated uh, by a recent work by romita rai which came out from uh, yale university press in 2013 where she talks about uh, the british artists uh, who drew on the uh, picturesque landscape of india uh, based on uh particularly two specific elements from indian biota not two specific but pr primarily two elements from the indian biota the banyan tree the book is actually titled under the banyan tree relocating the picture screen british india so my quest question in this presentation is to see if we can have uh, as the british artists were doing uh, to have a world readership of the colonial india that they possessed Uh, do we have a still earlier an antecedent uh, variation of the landscape which is possibly elusive which you do not see now uh, but uh, their traces are there in our uh, sources a particular kind of sources as you can see in the subtitle uh, in inscriptional corpus the texts possibly uh, have cues to understanding the nature of the landscape uh, of an earlier period 
uh, and uh, lead us to uh, an understanding of how the natural and built heritages environs and the man environment the uh, different layered and myriad linkages of man environment relationship those can be traced on the basis of these texts so these uh, the whole work is based on uh, a specific set of copper plate inscriptions as we all know these are dated mostly between the 5th and the 13th centuries and my work is based on Bengal copper plates so uh, on these copper plates we have so uh, on these in these copper plates we have a detailed description as you know of uh, alienation of land transfer of land to give you a rough idea of the geography of my uh, uh, study area this is uh, undivided historic bengal uh, west modern west bengal and bangladesh and these are the blocks where we find these are the clusters from where we find copper plate charters. These have been divided into several sub-regions as early as 1970 by Barry Morrison, as you all know. And within West Bengal territory of the Delta, uh, these are the fine spots, specific fine spots of the uh, uh, copper plate inscriptions from uh, the, the fine spots of the texts. And this, this is their geographical pattern of geographical distribution in terms of hydrography of the region. So, and this is uh, although it is geochronologically very disparate, but this is the general picture of uh, the uh, geography and chronology of the plates. We have a set of copper plates from northern Bengal in the 5th, 6th century. Then we have a set of plates uh, from southwestern Bengal in 6th century. In 7th century, we have a set of plates 7th and 8th century in uh, southeastern Bengal, modern Bangladesh, Kumila, Noakhali region. Then uh, from 8th century, we, we exclusively have plates from northern Bengal under the reign of the well-known Pala rulers. And then in the 12th century again, we have a set of plates from uh, southeastern Bengal and another set which actually comes from all parts of uh, Bengal, starting from uh, northern Bengal, Bangladesh sector, West Bengal sector to the extreme uh, southern Bengal. So this is the distribution of these plates. I'll come to the problem now. So in these plates, we have references to uh, um, locations of grants. Uh, these are the subjects of these inscriptions are exclusively to delineate the transfer of land in favor of either a group of people or a particular institution. Uh, for Bengal case, mostly these are uh, exclusively these are uh, Buddhist monasteries or Brahmanas. Individual donations are to Brahmanas of lands uh, or lands for maintenance of Buddhist monasteries. In other parts of the country, we have uh, copious references to detailed references to donations uh, towards temples also. Um, but in Bengal, mostly these are for uh, Buddhist monasteries. And in doing this, one segment of the inscription talks about what is terminologically called the boundary clause. It locates the plot of exact spot of the donation and in relation to that it uh, denotes the ex exact boundary of the plot as as we find in modern settlement records also uh, once a particular plot is located on a settlement record we see that uh, the all the boundaries to its north south east and west are still it's a living practice in our uh, in our legal practices so this was the case and in doing so in many of the inscriptions, we find reference to a large number of contiguous localities. This is one example that I have taken from the earliest copper plate that we see from Western Bengal. I mean, from modern boundary of West Bengal state in India. We have other references from North Bengal predating this, but those are from the Bangladesh sector of the Delta. So this is one example. And what is the settlement data? Uh, these are large number of names of uh, localities, the images, and different types of settlements. If I get back to the previous one, if we take a careful look, we have a grammar, we have a specific grammar as a settlement, we have an agrahara which has been already transformed into a rain-free village, we have a vartaka which is a hamlet, we have an agrahara vartaka, we have a vartaka agrahara in one of them also. So, uh, we, uh, uh, hamlet which has been converted into a rain-free land. So, different categories of rural settlements are there. So, and these are some of the narratives. Uh, uh, it's a set of about 120 copper plates. Here I'll uh, show you some representative samples from all sub-regions of uh, ancient Bengal. From North Bengal in the 5th, 6th century copper plates, we see that a table land, I'm uh, just uh, presenting this based on the translations of the texts of the copper plates. 
these are translations of the texts of the copper plates where these boundaries and locations of plots are mentioned. We have what are the elements of natural and built environments or artificial and natural landmarks. We have a table land, we have a pool, we have a cultivable field and then uh, in many of them uh, most of uh, large number of villages on most of them names of different villages. Uh, again we have names of villages now in the later part of the 5th century and early 6th century we are having a more detailed pattern of boundary in northern Bengal where we have a Sima a specific boundary of a village a specific Pradesh or a specific part western part Pashchima Pradesh of a village or even the jurisdiction of the village which is which has been translated as jurisdiction by DC Sarkar the Praveshya of a village has been used as a boundary marker now coming to 9th century during the reign time of the parlors the whole scenario changes now we have a boundary description of a plate where lands were being donated to a buddhist monastery by a royal officer and in delineating the boundary in describing the boundary this is the uh, narrative that we have we have a river close to that site then we have a stream which is specifically differentiated from the river then we have an em embankment now we have a narayana vasa which was certainly the temple of vishnu it was at one of the boundaries was a temple and then we have a lowland avakata we are having specific toponym specific uh, localized topographical feature of the landscape coming as part of the text of the boundary we have an avakata then we have uh, a python habitat Ash uh, ajagara vasaka is uh, Ajagara Vasaka is referred to as one of the boundaries. Then we have Ashwatha tree. Uh, so, uh, in the British India, if Banyan tree was the central point of uh, inquiry of uh, by by the art historians uh, in uh, identifying the Indian landscape, uh, there was no dearth of it in the earlier period as well. So, uh, what is not available is the landscape or is it not available that is my question finally with this presentation so we have an Ashwatha tree then another western bank Paschima Pasha of a, uh, um, um, of a waterfall we have Vilva tree a specific species of um, tree then an embankment again the Amalaki tree then the, this is a tank Nanda Surali actually this inscription is talking about a donation at uh, for a monastery which is called Nanda Dirki Vihara that monastery is also named after a specific topographical feature a large tank of the area so the monastery is also um, borrowing its name from uh, a water body and if we try to visualize this narrative this complicated narrative as a diagram this is the diagram that it shows this is the land uh, uh, this is this piece of land which is donated and these are all the elements natural and artificial elements of if I'm allowed to use the word heritage these are the elements of the environs and heritage that uh, uh, surround the landscape uh, the granted plot this is the North Bengal scenario. Coming to Western Bengal, we have a simplified version in the 6th century. Here we have only, na only names of three villages that are forming parts of the boundary. This is simple. You have three villages to four sites and all these villages are identifiable. I'll come to that point later. In 7th century, you are getting a, a little complicated variety of the thing. Here we have not only two villages, one to the Western side, other to the Eastern side. We also have reference to a specific spill Yanaka and not a river but a Ganginika which has been translated long back by Adi Banerjee and then by uh, other epigraphists that Ganginika is dried channel so when in 7th century this piece of land was being donated at that point of time only it was already a dried channel it was a moribund channel it was not a regular channel I'll come to the implication of this later and also we have reference to specific pond possibly pond uh, belonging to a, uh, one person uh, it's, it was it might be a, might have been a personal property now this is 
After 6th century, we don't have anything, uh, no evidence of copper plates from Western Bengal, in the Western part of Bengal. After 6th century, we get things from 12th century. And this is the narrative. I'm not reading the whole narrative. You can see the points. Then again, a river, a shasana, a boundary wall, the cattle track, uh, Gopatha, and then it starts with a river and ends up with a river. I'll, I'm not showing the uh, diagram here. I'll come to the diagram later. Uh, in southwestern Bengal, we have the most uh, bewildering variety of these narratives of the landscape in inscriptions. This is uh, in southeastern and southwestern Bengal. This is from southwestern Bengal. Here we have this one is from the Midnapur area of West Bengal, where we have a ditch, a lake, uh, a particular human settlement, then again ditch and lake, and even particular pigs were being uh, erected at points of uh, the boundary on which, uh, through which the plot is being marked. So we have a detailed description of the uh, boundary clause. And now coming to southwest, this is the, sorry, this is the diagram. This is the diagram of this, this is the diagram of this narrative. If this narrative is translated into a picture, this would somewhat be the thing, although this is not uh, one cannot be certain because it does not state from which point it starts, the boundary starts, the narrative starts. So you, there might be some alterations in this thing, but on the whole, this becomes the uh, boundary. And it, at all the points, we have specific ref, uh, references to elements of local topography or artificial boundaries. If you now go to the sites now, you have this narrative is specifically governed, it uh, revolves around number of pigs as boundary pillars. If you go to the sites uh, of this uh, area from where this plate was found, you find these dressed stone blocks placed at the uh, at one of the corners of the village, at the terminal part of the village, and some of these pillars are now have now been converted into local places of worship. They are now temples. They are the village deities. We have several such examples from Maharashtra, I know, but in Bengal, it's only from this part of Western Bengal that I've seen that such dressed pillars are either being used as markers of. Uh, um, uh, uh, these are either used as places of worship or they uh, lie in isolation but at the terminal parts of modern settlements, villages. So are these really remnants of the markers of boundaries that these inscriptions are talking about? Because this is precisely from the area from which this inscription was found. And in southeastern Bengal again we have a large number of elements uh, uh, appearing as boundaries. We have field boundaries, we have uh, Agrahara a, a village, we have different uh, arable landscapes as uh, uh, boundary markers and also Pushkarari which is omnipresent. Here we have very interestingly the landing point of a boat, a landing point of boats, no water as a uh, boundary marker. We also have uh, a Vihara in one of them. Here we have Temple, a temple of Pradyumneshwar as one of the boundary markers. And then, here we also have a Buddhist monastery as one of the boundary markers, apart from the temples and households, uh, rivers, temples, households, rivers, and lowlands. These are making um, uh, elements of boundary. We have many such references and in one of these texts, which is, uh, I mean inscriptions, which is also a text. I'm taking inscription as a text and not getting into the problem of why I'm calling an inscription a text. That might be a different topic altogether. So in 9th, 10th century, we see in this particular copper plate, we have, this is the um, description of a king marching against the kings of Assam and uh, this is the description that they see flying sea pigeons, banana groves, monkeys, uh, drowsy yurks, aloe wood trees, and a river, and then storax, and then again a river, and then again different elements of faunal and floral species as well as topographical features in the form of water bodies, spills, dried channels, 
and built uh, elements of built environs like uh, contiguous village, temple or monastery and wide variety of different types of water bodies. These are the elements that we, that we see and just to have just to have a have an idea of how why so many water bodies are appearing in these inscriptions this is a modern google map uh, showing the distribution of extensive distribution of water bodies in this area in southeastern bengal in, i mean in modern day so these are the elements i have talked about so i personally as a student of archaeology worked in the field based on these narratives and uh, uh, boundary descriptions on at two four of the uh, sites of West Bengal. Uh, into, uh, these are these were my uh, agenda or goal to uh, study the area, uh, to have an understanding of the nature of early medieval settlements and uh, uh, to identify the uh, expansion of the settlement and spatial patterning of the settlement. But for this, we needed to first locate specifically from where these copper plates are found as students of history and archaeology know that copper plates are named based on their fine spots but in most cases we don't know the fine spots of the plates so if we want to have a specific idea of the landscape characters based on the narratives in the copper plates first we need to know the fine spot of the copper plate, copper plate because most of the places that are mentioned in the copper plate are located in close proximity to the fine spot of the place in most cases there are exceptions also so this is the sixth century plate that i had referred to and this is the boundary description where you have three villages to its neighborhood and this is the uh, fine spot of the inscription and if we see the number of villages mentioned in the copper plate all of them can be located in the modern landscape just surrounding the provenance of the plate on the basis of phonetic similarity of the names suppose a village is called Godha Grama in the inscription you go to the site you see a village which is called Gohagram and there is a village called uh, Shalmali Vataka you go to the area and see the village called Sharul and that if that Shalmali Vataka according to the text is located to the northwest of Godhagram, Godhagrama, Godhagrama you see that in the modern landscape also Sharul is located to the northwest of Gohagram. in this uh, rational we started identifying these settlements many of these were identified by our epigraphists because in all these early epigraphic publications if we carefully read we see that they are talking about these identifications regularly the antiquity of the site is one of the major points of uh, the introductory portion of uh, this inscriptional literature uh, here we identified all the villages but this the granted village we could not identify the granted village is called Vetragarta. There was no village in which has close linguistic or phonetic similarity with that name that exists here. So we could not identify this one, the granted plot. But what was interesting is what is located here, which should be the granted plot considering the geographical orientation of other villages. That village is called Puranga, an old village. Although its name is its name cannot be identified in terms of inscriptional uh, text. Here in the 7th century, I have shown this slide earlier, where, when I said the boundary clause is getting complicated. Here we see uh, the villages and spill and also a dried channel. Now, if we go to the area, we see that not only the three villages that are mentioned in the description, if you see the names of village number one, village number two and village number three, not only these three villages are identifiable on the landscape, but we found finally that a moribund channel still runs. If when we searched in the satellite imagery, we found that this Ganginika dried channel still runs and to the north of the area, as it is there in the inscriptional narrative, you see it. Uh, see this on the landscape, and also we have. I'll come to the next slide. Here we also have. Uh, 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 this is the dry channel and here we also have a paleo channel that moves if we take a look again at the narrative here we have a yanaka a spill which is to the east southeast 
and if this is the granted area here we have if this is the granted village to the east southeast we still have a paleo channel does this represent the narrative i mean the counterpart of the inscriptional yanaka or uh, uh, spill remains a question but this is a distinct probability that was one case uh, here we have a plate from northern Bengal this copper plate was discovered in uh, 1990 but early, way back in 1938 this site was excavated from where this copper plate was found the, where the excavator uh, excavated a granary a damp proof granary has as the excavator called it uh, it was a large built brick granary and it was excavated in 1938-41 and in 1990 a uh, set of two copper plates are being found by a villager from that area in that plate it is said that a village is located to the specific we are running out of time within five minutes please close huh? oh oh sure so uh, this village is located to a specific side of the uh, of a granary the inscription says they, it is to the south western part or something uh, something of a dakshiravadi uh, chaykhandanke of a specific um, granary called devi kotiya koshthagar so when, so when we started searching for the village we found that a village which has the uh, corrupted version of its earlier name exists to the excavated site of granary to the exact southwest part of the southeast part of the excavated granary and there also we found this is the location of the village and this is the location of the uh, uh, find spot of the inscription so or rather the uh, excavated granary so the village locate is located to the specific uh, side of the granary as it is described here so i'm getting back to that narrative again and of 12th century and this is the uh, uh, image that we derive from that uh, inscriptional narrative uh, that i didn't show we see that a village and its boundary markers are so complicated now pr probably of course because of uh, pressure of land increasing pressure of land with the passage of time it's in 12th century so we have so here also we have of all the specimens of boundary uh, narrated here we have all of them almost identifiable on the ground what is not identifiable fiable was one of these villages which is which is called Nadina Shasan what is interesting is this is not identifiable this Nadina is not identifiable what we see in place of Nadina is this stretch of arable land which is now called now Dingar Mart as you can realize the name has existed the name has continued but the settlement has lost its identity the village has been shifted but the name persists it uh, the name exists it continues in cultural memory that's why the uh, corruption of the name Nadina exists at now Dingar Mart although the settlement is not here anymore and what is most interesting is if you remember I had said that the boundary revolves around a particular river it starts with a river and ends with a river and this is the river in the inscription it's called the river is called Singatia and this is local people now still call it Singte river and all the villages are identified in and around this uh, particular spill so we have different problems which are archaeological problems I'm not getting into this and these are the elements of uh, I mean which are identifiable tangible elements of heritage that we see at the site the picturesque element can be only recreated through these uh, descript these uh, diagrams that I prepared so the picturesque element is possibly lost but what is left is traces of it our job is to uh, make a complete picture based on the traces of these elements on the landscape uh, I'm not sure if I'm clear yes sir I'll just take two minutes I'll just take two minutes sir so these are the elements in the form of structural mounds several of them in all of these areas of uh, inquiry which are narrated in the inscriptions then we have 
early historic remains found from these areas, the ubiquitous omnipresent element of uh, material culture pottery, which are the issue of dating, these are all, I'm not getting into those things. We can have maybe some questions on them when, during the discussion. Then we have sculptural material, I mean coming to the tangible elements. And then again, pottery remains. And in all these areas where we find these identifiable villages, we see a specific pattern, linear clustered pattern of early settlements that can be identified and all these archaeological sites I mean these archaeological sites are all located within the sphere of the identifiable villages many of these identifiable villages are sites themselves and if we make a survey we can have a clear idea of the patterning of these settlements it's based on uh, four one two, three, yes, three of this uh, copper plates. The fourth one is still under progress. We are still ca carrying on uh, field work. So if we can have a detailed work on the boundaries of, uh, boundary markers of these inscriptions from different parts of the country, we can have a more clearer picture. My humble argument is we can have a more general, clearer picture of the nature of natural and built environmental factors that are uh, subjects of our uh, lost picturesque natural and built heritages. So this was my point. Actually this work was carried out. I have been doing this for quite some time but uh, for uh, since 2014 this was funded by the Indian National Science Academy as part of a history of science project. So my sincere thanks to the authorities of uh, INSA and uh, finally, to Professor Bhivaji Pati, ma'am, because I remember for all the three years she was one of the members of the council and she consistently, consistently she encouraged me uh, with my reports, every annual report that yes, now I see this is a well-articulated attempt, you should carry out this research. Of course, this encouragement was, uh, uh, was uh, of a greater meaning for me and that, uh, that meant much for me. So, thank you ma'am and thank you all. I don't know if in with uh, the hurry uh, because of the shortage of time I could explain my points properly but and this was the argument that these sources can be also used. Thank you. So, so can we have questions? Yes. Uh, one thing is, one of the scholar is not coming in the next session, so they just want to run a video also. So I have told that uh, the first thing will be, okay, now we are, we are still having about uh, five to seven minutes. So. I will request for three questions, one for uh, Dr. Sen, and other for Maruti, and the third is for <laughs> Ratnay. And so the three questions, anyone can ask regarding that, please. Yes, please. Thank you, Professor Joy Shen, for your Excellent lecture, and I just I want to add that uh, the construction of Oroville is marvelous, and bipolarity is there. The two triangle symbol of Sri Aurobindo, one is aspiration going to the supreme, and another is supreme grace coming down to earth. And mother symbol, Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasharshuti, both are under the crystal, and the pillars also symbolize the mother and the Param Brahman Supreme. And bipolarity is there and structure is beautiful. And um, um, I'll be very much pleased to uh, hear if, if uh, any time you can give the details. That is all. You have to prepare any time. It's for you. 
Thank you. I think it's an opportunity, and I think we all know uh, the recognition came from the United Nations to UNESCO, and uh, Oroville had a carrying capacity of 50,000. I mean, which was a which was a threshold which was set by the mother. You know, uh, if I say it in light of the two wonderful talks after me, to get the right spurs, uh, so that if the population increases the exchanges of the right spurs vanishes from the society and to get the right landscape of things, the right density, the right built density, the right intensity of the development, the right distribution of the population. Now today we are talking about cities in millions and all that. So uh, there is a big uh, dichotomy there. So that's why our cities are mostly uh, a pathological one a system rather than generative. You know, the cities are becoming more dependent on the region rather being contributive. On the one hand, in the words of Gandhiji, we have neglected our cities, our villages. And on the other hand, we have not been able to create good cities. You know, if you go to the books by Louis Mumford, Louis Mumford, who was uh, very close to Patrick Geddes, uh, he has talked about that the, the best cities in the world, the last good cities after Mahanjoda and Harappa were probably built by the Greeks, you know, it, 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 for example, Athens, where you had a port for the economic people, then you had an Odeon amphitheater for the cultural people, and then you have a uh, acropolis on the, on, the, on the top of the hill for the spiritual minded people. For the city had different accommodations for different groups of people, you know, different landscapes. Today we have cities only for businessmen, cities only for you know, a particular focus. So we have lost those balances. And I think we all know in the design of the city, two great minds came in, or other than Roger Agner, it was Frantisek Seymour and uh, Antonia Raymond. And very interestingly, they're the two disciples of Lee Corbusier and uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the greatest architect, architects of, of, of the whole uh, and, uh, humanity. So, and in addition to that, you know, as you said, the whole concept of the Unmana and the Shamana of the Sri Chakra, uh, uh, which was simplified. So that is actually a symbol which connects India also with Judaism, which is the Star of David and the Seal of Solomon. So. And finally, the distribution of the central core, which is Adya Shakti, into the four quadrants, which is the Chatur Vedas, you know, you know, because all our Vedic altars are basically quadrangle. Essentially, it's a quadrangle. And then the final decomposition of that into the 12 orbs, the Dadash Aditya Mandala, and the 12, the two. Yeah, so I think, so this is the whole thing. Thank you. Next question. Anybody? No, please, please. I'm neither an archaeologist nor an Indologist. I'm an engineer, moved in the fields. I just um, question, Mr. Shannal. I've been moving along Ganges, making projects. Can your topic be connected to river engineering? which Mr. Tula in Germany had done for Rhine for at least 50 years. And Rhine was shortened to have its life. So this is maybe an you know, unrelated subject, but which I was quite impressed by your talks. Sir, actually for our case the problem is most of these water bodies they are not large water bodies in many cases. You don't find regular references to rivers, I mean, uh, rivers like Ganges. Of course, we have some references. We have references to the Kshir or the river. As I uh, showed you, we can, of course, identify many of these spills, but these are on the score of their uh, satellite imageries or uh, topo sheet specificities. So, uh, uh, if the question of river engineering comes, I don't know if these sources are uh, usable, but at least one or two case studies are important. If we take one or two specific case studies based on these local water bodies, the uh, Pushkarinis, if this specific water resource was being utilized in a, in a particular cyclic manner throughout the year by particularly for irrigation and other things by these identifiable villages. And such a case study might reveal something new. Um, I really do not know if uh, this would be anything revealing or, uh, I mean, rewarding, but that might have okay, lead us to.
No. It is not audible, sir. It is not audible, sir. Please. Actually, this river engineering subject, which is not there in any of our engineering colleges, now possibly it has been added in three. In Shripur, it is not there. Because I was walking along these Ganges in lot many places, and I, I was unloading, you know, material from the barges, which I unloaded from 30 years back. Now those backwater is finished. It is in Haldi, it's sir. That made me to, you know, search that subject since 2002, 2003. And then this topic came in Gottfried Tula in Germany. I found he has walked almost 30, 35 years. And possibly now I find in this Prime Minister's Ganga case, Rhinan Ganga case has been interrelated in some of the West website uh, topics. Right, that right. has made me to ask this question. Understood. Understood. Thank you. I think I have already no. reacted, yes. No, no, thank you. May I just give one suggestion? That uh, Rajat is available here, yes. so <laughs> so you, 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 you can have one to one discussion also, and he will solve, he will tell you many other things also. Hmm? So please, um, I must confess very apologetically that I am neither an archaeologist nor a student of history. My question is, or rather curiosity, is from a layman's perspective. Uh, I've been listening to Professor Joyesh and talking about his topic, and uh, I believe at one point of time I felt he said. Uh, in order to be able to understand the Vastu Purusha Mandala, one needs to realize that the Khetragya inside the Khetra is the Mandala. I mean, if that realization is not really there, would somebody be a good Vastukar? That's a million, million dollar. That's a million dollar question. And I think my answer won't appease the Vastukars, you know. So I'll refrain from that. But uh, nothing is momentary, nothing can be achieved in a day. Even a little boy goes through a 10 years of school journey yes. and four years of college journey and then uh, a master's and a PhD level. And then again he feels that he's still a student. If he's a good student, he'll feel that way. If he's a good student, he'll feel that way. So same is with the case of a Vasugar. If you have spoken to some great architects like Charles Courier and uh, Bibi Doshi, you know, he told us five minutes joy, I don't have much time. Then he was with us for three hours in Sangat. That's the quality of, a, I mean, he's famous. He has hundreds of commissions and projects, but he has time for ordinary people like us. So this is uh, the attitude, the humanity, you know, to be able to embrace is more important than any technical knowledge. Architecture, for example, is a science of built environment. So it is just not designing buildings but it's designing spaces, you know, that wonderful presentation which uh, uh, Rajat, I'm calling him Rajat, yeah, he's like my younger please, brother. Please. This beautiful landscape presentation, what are these basically? These are patient, respectful renderings along the river, along water bodies, kunds, you know, the whole of Varanasi. The whole of Varanasi is actually, uh, is, a, is an array of kunds. Sir knows that 100 times better than me. And then some British engineer, James Princip and others, they came and they made a drainage channel yes. and outfall channel. And Varanasi's kunds have been uh, put, shelved to the, to the zones of outfall areas and with very high level of eutrophications and BODs and CODs. And they have become, you know, pathological states. If you look at uh, uh, a sea right now, it's a, it's it's like a it's like a nala. It's yeah, an ayana. Yeah. But there are celebrated narratives, epigraphy from the time. The famous Bhagavati Sukta of Jainism describes the Asi Nala, not as nala, but as a river of wisdom, as a river of wisdom. So look at the way we have dealt with our, you know, in the name of engineering, water engineering, river engineering, hydrological engineering. Knowledge is all fine, but it's just not engineering. It's a lot of humanity. It's a lot of ecological patience. It's ecosystems planning. It's it's, it's, it's a connect between the Khetra, your question, and the Khetra. You know. So even the river is seen as a lifeline of civilization. You know, it's seen as, you know, at, at Varanasi, what is happening to the river? It's, a, it's one of the few points where the Ganga is Uttar Bahini. You know, Jagadish Chandra Bosch gave that answer. Nodi tumi kota hoite ashite cho. So the, the Nadi which is heading for the ocean, the destination, has not forgotten its origin, where it's coming from. That's civilization. So Uttar Bahini, Jaha Jaha Uttar Bahini, 
तहा तहा काशी काशी का कांची उत्तर काशी and other kashis so this is something we, we have to go back to you know these are not simple o kya hai theek hai bakwas hai kushaj kar hai it's not as easy as that these are strong ecological sciences with deep constructs and not sympathetic but emphatic exchanges with nature that's what rajat was beautifully trying to show you know all those uh, footprints where expressions and they could be the last things of a much preceding age yes, yes, they could be the they, those could be the I last know, things yes, of a much preceding age and the, the shungas were there all over india madam was talking about the shungas the shungas fought alexander on the one hand the shungas had built the sanchi stupa and the all hand the shungas were powerful in chandraketugar on the other hand who are the shungas we have not looked at shungas that way you know there is no chapter on the shungas in indian architecture in indian history and things like that i mean how many of us know about shungas mm -hmm. i started learning about shungas just four or five years back you know you know the pushyamitra shoda the malavika agnimitram which sir talked about is a beautiful treatise where the rigveda records yeah you know and 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 the entire shunga dynasty is actually a reflection of the aryan culture not by race but as a way of life aryan ship is not by genetics it's as a way of life if somebody has that way of life even an african is also an arya it's also an arya this is a definition of sri aurobindo thank yeah. you thank you so uh, i will allow because there is nothing and i am also not hungry no i am also not hungry one thing but <laughs> आपको तो मैं मना कर ही नहीं सकता थैंक यू सो मच Rajat's Rajat's presentation was very, very concrete and uh, down to earth, I should say. But the other two presentations were so much in abstraction. that they they have taken uh, transported me to another world so to say and uh, i i have one observation to make uh, with uh, professor mnp tiwari uh, nobody asked him anything so i think i i should uh, to to do the honor it was a wonderful presentation and uh, so far as his his uh, um, Uh, effort to find the the sparsh in all indian art uh, medium was wonderful no doubt about it but i was wondering that we are sitting in a in a seminar on built heritage how can we connect the two i mean the the built heritage and the sparsh can you make an effort tiwari ji yes sparsh i i i just try to mention <laughs> that it was both tangible and intangible sparsh in the past it is heritage through sparsh the feelings were communicated throughout uske bina ya to verbal hoga ya to non verbal mein hoga to then it will be uh, uh, sparsh aap jaise just one example bharat milap i have mentioned i have shown uh, example from heritage mahabalipuram is first what does it, it it is it is distinctly suggestive of what what feeling it does have to connote very clear only heritage it does when it comes to the visual expression it it will be uh, uh, intangible or sorry tangible otherwise it will be i i said it could be it could be verbal it it could be uh, manas it it could be if, if when it is physical so physical past and present actually this is the problem heritage we should not take that only heritage pertains to the past heritage has the inbuilt quality of the continuity if it has the potential why why do we talk of ekam sat vikra bahuda vadanti why 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 at all you have mentioned no it was not necessity why dharma so no these all are heritage and heritage which uh, swami ji yesterday talked about and sparsh is one of such very important area of our heritage 
through his first the communications were made throughout in, in literary, in art, art manifestations and all that. Okay. It's a very vast subject. Hmm? It's a very vast subject. This is a very vast subject. No, vast, but it's not a good thing, right? That's the beauty of such sessions. It raises more questions than answers any. And it makes us think. So uh, it would be wonderful. Thakur, uh, Lord Ramakrishna used to say, Khali pete dharma hai na. So khali pete chinta hai na. Uh, obviously that goes as a corollary. So while we eat, we can regurgitate, we can discuss, we can uh, debate. And uh, even as we do that, we can also come back here so that we can start yes. again at 2 o'clock. Okay, one so, thing is there. <laughs> uh, can we have the documentary in the next session, ma'am, for five minutes, yes. a five, six minutes video? I mean, I subject. Think, I, I think next session. As, as you say, sir. Yes, sir. Because uh, it should be bind up now. Uh, I, I thank all the three scholars. Thank you, sir. And, and uh, especially our professor from IIT, who has spoken on mandalas and other things on the Vashwast. Our Professor Maruti Nandan, I will discuss his first, to what kind of his verses are there, and they are all represented in Indian art. And uh, our Rajat, Rajat has also given. And then one thing is there in the Rajat lecture, he, they have tried to come, to mix up the planning also, which is a modern subject, which is generally taught to the architects and others by the school of planning and architecture and so on. So he's tried also to take the help of that planning in his project while giving the details of that, how the, inter in how the description which mentioned a particular size, they can be interpreted. So all these th three scholars, I once again congratulate them for giving their beautiful address to the audience and now we should proceed for the lunch.